Hi everyone, my name is Angie Peacock. I'm on the Medicaid Normal Outreach team. I'm also a subject of the film. I was trained as a social worker and a therapist, but I was harmed by psychiatric medication that I took as prescribed. I also volunteer doing outreach for the film and I host conversations like this one today. This is our 29th interview and today our guest is Roxanne Stewart Johnson. We met her because she um, sent us an email. We get tons of emails every day from people all over the world. And um, she said, hey guys, I, I just made a film. How can we collaborate? And uh, me and some of my team members watched it and we were just really moved by her story and it has many parallels to our film. So I'm just bringing her here to our conversation to tell her own story, to talk about the film that she has to um, hopefully gain her some interest, gain some interest in our community. So her bio is Roxanne Stewart Johnson. She's a filmmaker and motion graphic artist from Jamaica. After being granted refugee protection in Canada from domestic violence in an abusive psychiatric system, she has endeavored to tell the story of her ordeal and the human rights abuses perpetrated against the mentally ill in Jamaica. Since coming to Canada, she completed a master's in journalism at Ryerson University in Toronto, and she hopes to pursue human rights advocacy through media. Roxanne, would you like to share a few words about yourself and just kind of talk about, um, just talk about yourself, fill in the blanks. Sure, sure. Well, um, I'm a mom. Um, I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder type one uh, when I, uh, in my early 20s, um, while I was pursuing my master's the first time in the United States. And um, that really introduced me into the whole psychiatric system, which I had knew very little about, um, didn't know anything about drugs or side effects or human rights issues. You know, I told I had this diagnosis, but I really did not know the consequences of being labeled like that and, um, you know, what the consequences were socially. And it was uh, basically a 13-year journey of discovering what this meant and um, discovering that there are a lot of things I didn't like that, you know, that were a part of now being a, a person with a mental illness. So um, yeah, so this story kind of uh, talks about it a lot and talks about my escape. So yeah, thank you so much for being here. So uh, let's jump into some questions. When I was watching your film, I was just struck by the amount of trauma that you experienced and betrayal, not only from like, you know, your family life, um, some abuse from your father and then husband abuse and then abuse from the system. And it's almost like you had nowhere to run that was safe, you know? So um, can you share a little bit about your story? Cause it's, it's a pretty long film to sit through and it's very traumatic, I mean, to watch it. Uh, can you just give in a nutshell kind of a little bit about your story about what happened and what brought you to the mental health care system? Sure. So my story, uh, the film literally just chronicles um, my experience. Well, uh, kind of coming to this point where I had never experienced this before, but um, where I was being coerced and threatened by a psychiatrist for the first time in my life. I had never experienced this before and it was quite bizarre and, and um, you know, and it, and I thought I would definitely have protection from this behavior, which was very aggressive. And, you know, I, I thought this, this can't be legal, this can't be right. And, you know, I looked for protection. Um, uh, in Jamaica and realized that, you know, and from prior experiences of mistreatment, um, I realized that this is not a country that is going to offer me any kind of justice or legal recourse or protection from what this psychiatrist was doing. So I knew at that point, um, you know, leave and make a refugee claim in another country because there is no escape from this. So really, um, the the story just chronicles literally that. It chronicles how I ended up in front of this psychiatrist who was threatening me, um, me trying to find help from all kinds of different sources, me fleeing the country and finally coming to Canada and then having to navigate the whole refugee system, which was not, I would say, tailored to persons who were escaping the, the form of persecution that I was escaping. So right. 
that's that's literally what the story and the, and the film is about. Yeah, so in the film, I liked it when you said um, that what you're experiencing, you heard that first word that was persecution. And I think that was the word. And you, yeah. you someone told you that the lawyer said, this is persecution. And you were like, oh, wow, it, like the light bulbs went off. Yes, yes, this is what was happening to me. It was, it was persecution. But you also use the word oppression. So can you define the word oppression and maybe persecution too, and just talk about how the mental health care system oppressed and persecuted you? So yeah, so uh, so persecution is really a legal term used in in refugee law, and um, I thought it was a pretty weird term because I had only heard of it in the Bible, you know, like the 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 early um, Paul and and the apostles fleeing persecution and stuff like that. So I'd never heard it in a, a legal context like that. I thought that was very strange, but it really is very specific. Um, persecution in refugee law refers to very severe forms of human rights abuses. So um, a, a great rule of thumb are the three L's, life, liberty, and limb. So if somebody's threatening your life, somebody's threatening to lock you up, take away your liberty, or someone's threatening physical harm. So that's really the principle that guides what is persecution. So I had to learn that because I had never, I, I knew nothing about refugee law. I just knew that it was you know, refugees are escaping human rights abuses. So that's what I'm doing. Um, so yeah, so, but looking at that, especially the three L's, life, liberty, and limb, I knew that this doctor was trying to take away my liberty. I knew that this doctor was going to harm me and the child I was carrying. So that's my limb. And, and you know, and, and these, these side effects, actually, my, even the psychiatrist, was treating me here in Canada said that these are potentially life threatening. So mm -hmm. I thought, yeah, that that basically covers it. Um, oppression, I would say definitely in my experience of psychiatric drugs, um, particularly antipsychotics, um, antipsychotics, besides all of the physiological issues that they cause, the tardive dyskinesia, the motor control issues, and things like that, um, they can cause serious, severe depression um, to the point of even suicidal depression. And I definitely experienced that in my, ex uh, in my experience of, of antipsychotics. And I, I can't think of anything worse or more oppressive than somebody forcing drugs on you that would cause suicidal depression. And yet they're doing that in the name of mental health. So I would say that's the oppression form of psychiatry. Yeah, and I posted the film a few days ago to try to get our audience to watch it before you came on, but, and I don't wanna give the film away, obviously, but can you just specifically say what the psychiatrist was trying to do? Sure, so um, when I went in there, I was only there to get a refill on my prescription. And my father, cause we were going, I was going through a lot of different changes. My husband had left me alone with my child, um, you know, we had just gotten married. I was experiencing trouble at work, trouble with my family. So my, my father kind of had this false idea that a psychiatrist is someone that you can talk to about the issues in your home. So he kind of started just, you know, laying out his heart and saying, oh my gosh, she's not getting on with her mother. And she just got married and her husband's left. And and now we have debt. So he was actually there just to, I, I know that in his mind, he was just like, I'm gonna talk to the psychiatrist and tell him what's going on at home. It's so stressful. And um, the response, he was not prepared for either. I was not prepared for, he was not prepared for. Um, this psychiatrist is not somebody that you can unload uh, all your emotional burdens to. She was like, um, basically, oh, what you're telling me is this is a troublemaker. This is a troublemaker. And um, she, like my father even told her, like just off the cuff, because he just knows it's about me. Like, oh, she hates the, the side effects of the drugs. You know, she, she really had a hard time with them and she hates them, right? Uh, so she, he just, out, you know, just laid that out. And the psychiatrist literally said, oh yeah, well, I'm going to drug you with a lanzapine, diazepam, lamictal, and a higher dose of chitiapine. And it, it was so aggressive. Yeah. I, I, I say in the, in, in the film, I literally thought she was joking because um, 
like you know to for for someone to say she's afraid of the drugs so therefore you're going to threaten them well are you afraid of them well i'm going to drug you with this so yeah, and wait and wait tell them this is all on a recording yes this she's is all not making this up like this is recorded <laughs> yes this is all yeah. recorded you know and stuff which which really helped in my case but um yeah so you know i was really like nobody had ever done that to me before i had never faced coercive psychiatry yet um certainly i was coerced by my family to, to take different medications and stuff but i could always like kind of say you know no this is I, I don't like this but to have an authority there saying i'm going to drug you with this and in a threatening you know like uh in a very threatening manner um that was the first time that was happening and uh you know it, it's funny um so let's see how, how could i describe this okay basically i knew there was no arguing with this person i was not going to start sticking up for myself i was not going to start making excuses or whatever because i like saw that this person was dead serious right yeah. first i thought she was joking but then she told my father listen if she because i she oh the first thing she did was said hmm do you need hospitalization roxanne right in that manner with the whole you know with the yeah. gesticulations and stuff and i knew that you know the most important thing is to stay calm because if you go no oh my gosh then they're totally going to use that against you to say see she's crazy let's restrain her she's going off the so i just said calm and i i said no um i don't think i need hospitalization and i would never go to ward 21 anyway and then she started really making her case like she stopped speaking to me started speaking directly to my father only saying you know this is the thing if she goes to another hospital they can't force her to take the drugs but at ward 21 you know we can make her take those drugs right and um so i realized at that point don't argue with this woman don't argue with it because she was so um she was very adversarial yeah. right so that's when i took my phone out and started recording because i realized that this um yeah don't try if anything get help afterwards record this and see if you can get some legal help right so i had her on recording but then she was like just talking to my father listen this is what she needs you know she needs to go to the hospital now because this is that and whatever and that's that's what basically happened no the funny thing is that my father has in the past he's kind of understood where i stood with medication you know with regards to the side effects and the weight gain and the somnolence and everything like that so he was never a proponent of yes let's force medication on her but at the same time he did not want to argue with her either because the jamaican professional society um him as a lawyer she as a doctor you don't get on person's bad sides because mm -hmm. you're gonna end up rubbing shoulders with them you know this is a potential client even you don't want to get on this person's bad side so you know i wished he would have stood up for me and said no we're definitely not doing that that's crazy but instead he didn't agree with her but he was kind of like you know i, I would almost say slightly afraid of her as well yeah. i like um, i mean i liked what he said he was like what about diet what about exercise what about something else you know he was offering alternatives and she was like no 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 she needs more drugs you know <laughs> exactly she he was even saying you know well how come he, she didn't have an episode when she was pregnant the last yeah. time and right. he's gently trying to get us out of the situation because he didn't realize the situation he now put us in right by unloading to this doctor all my problems right so he's trying to to get us out of the situation but she is like no um you know this no not at this point this can't work talking doesn't work you know she needs drugs now and um so that's that's basically what happened and um you know truthfully according to the mental health act in jamaica she could have actually acted on her own she could have just said um i don't care what you're saying I'm taking her in. Um, but again, she also did not want to offend this prominent lawyer. Um, right. So 
um, she starts saying, well, she starts backtracking. She starts backpedaling because when my father is not going along with it and constantly kind of trying to make excuses as to why this is not going to work, um, she backpedals and she's like, you know, uh, having bipolar doesn't take away all your rights. And, uh, you know, and, and, and Roxanne is not uh, psychotic, so I can't uh, do anything. And she, she literally admits there on the recording that I'm not sick. She admits that I'm not suicidal, that I'm not psychotic, that I'm not a danger to anyone. And she also says that I'm, I seem to be taking good care of my son, right? Mm -hmm. But yet goes back after that and saying, you know, she still needs admission. And, um, and then argues with my father, she's not willing to sign. She's not willing to sign, you know? As a, I, I literally had to just, you know, interject. I, I, I'm going to talk to a lawyer. That's all I'm going to do. That's just a little bit. Yeah. And kind of give her I mean it was just divine intervention really um I was very close to being hospitalized at that point you yeah. know which would have been devastating because I was 13 weeks pregnant at the time right so um so yeah so I I narrowly escaped that situation and but I didn't want to find out for myself what would happen afterwards but that brings up an important point because it it just gave me shivers when i you know you're pregnant with this baby and she's saying i want you to sign this paper to say that you're going to take the drugs that i prescribe you and you're basically not going to sue me if something happens to your unborn child and maybe that's not that's not how they would do that in the united states obviously that conversation would not even be had i don't even think they wouldn't even bring up you know these drugs have risks for the fetus we don't even know all the risks. So, you know, but I just want to bring in here, um, we just meet so many women, especially college age women who are put on an antidepressant or whatever, you know, for um, maybe stress from college or they're far away from home. And then they get really scared when they watch the film because they say, oh my God, like I'm on Prozac and what's going to happen when I want to have a baby, you know, because nobody is giving informed consent about this. So can you just talk briefly about being a mother, being on psychiatric drugs, your fears, you know, like take me through that a little bit. Sure. So with my first pregnancy, my first son, Ben, um, I, I was lucky enough to have a gem of a psychiatrist, um, Dr. Charles Sessaker, and he respected the fact that I wanted to do my pregnancy without drugs. Um, you know, he was a good advocate for me, actually. He even talked to my parents and said that they were too intrusive into my personal life. But, you know, I, I, he would advocate for me. And um, so luckily enough for that first pregnancy, I was able to um, to have it without drugs, even though I had taken drugs in the past. Um, and uh, it, it went pretty good. I did, um, however, experience, I guess what they'd call postpartum psychosis three months after I gave birth. Um, so that led to my uh, 2015 hospitalization, which I, I met an abusive doctor um, who, who did, uh, drug me without my consent. Um, but yeah, so, but I, I was lucky enough to have that experience first. And so, and I had met another doctor too, who had said that she treats several women who become pregnant and have families and, and have your diagnosis rocked. And so there's no reason for you to not be able to have a family um just because you have bipolar disorder or just because you're taking drugs or whatever so that had been my experience and in my mind so what this doctor was saying about you know you should abort because there's no way you can carry out this pregnancy safely and stuff like that i was like i i know two professional psychiatrists who say otherwise and and of course then meaning doc uh dr um Namaki richards who was like, oh, well, we definitely have drugs that are safe during pregnancy. Um, I, whereas my first pregnancy was completely without drugs. Um, my second pregnancy was a bit trickier. And so um, I was on the drug ketiapine to, to help me sleep um, mm -hmm. during the pregnancy. But luckily, it's it's one of the safest drugs that you, you can take during pregnancy. So I, I, I was very glad that I was able to exercise agency and say, okay, you know what, I feel like, personally, I feel like I do need drugs, but I would like to take the safest route possible. Yeah. So during the film, you also had to do a lot of your own research. I, I found it fascinating because I actually wrote an article about a woman who sued the state of Ohio 
Um, and she had to do the same thing you did. She lay, literally just sat in her basement in withdrawal from psychiatric drugs and read case law about like how to sue a doctor, how to sue for malpractice. And she had to like learn how to be a lawyer. And in a way you did the same thing. You learned to be an immigration attorney basically because you had to build your own case. You had to get your, all your files together, which most people in the psychiatric system who've been drugged and oppressed the way that you have might not have the capability to do that and to fight so hard. So can you tell us like, what did you learn in your research? Um, what were some of your most influential books, your takeaways, your most surprising things about that research? Well, the most surprising thing, well, all right, uh, Jamaica has like a slew of human rights issues. So I wasn't really surprised when I found news articles saying that the mentally ill were being abused in psychiatric institutions. Like that wasn't a big surprise to me. But when I found out about a UN treaty that's specific to the rights of mental patients, it's called the UN Principles for the Protection of Persons with Mental Illness. And uh, Jamaica had signed on to that. Um, and, uh, you know, looking at that document for the first time, because I found it in a Jamaican news article where a doctor was saying, listen, we've signed on to this treaty and this is not what we are doing in our treatment of the mentally ill. So reading that document for the first time, reading the, the UNMI principles, I was like, oh my gosh, you're supposed to do this. You're supposed to allow the patient to do this and learning all of that, like, was well one it was amazing I was very excited because I was like I have a case right and two like you know seeing a human a human rights legislation or document or treaty that was specific to mental health um that was very exciting and encouraging and I was like oh my gosh well the doctor did this and it says right here in principle three you don't do this and and whatever so I was like but I know that what these doctors are doing is illegal or human rights violation. So I have a case here, I have a case. So that was what was very, very exciting. Mm. Yeah. And what were, what were some of the books that you read and uh, were most influential for you? Uh, you know what, I didn't really read, a, it was mostly like UN articles, news articles, because um, yeah, so, uh, there were a few, yeah, just, just documents really not, not yeah. books per se. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I guess like later on uh, during the whole process, like probably like over a year in, I found um, the UN Special Rapporteurs uh, on the right to health, Danius Purex had, had done a report and it was specifically looking at the issue of over-medication, over-medicating somebody and saying that, listen, over-medicating a patient is a kind of torture. And yeah. I was like, this couldn't come at a better time because every lawyer that I was talking to seemed, well, they were basically like saying, well, you know, the specifics of mental health aren't mentioned in refugee law, which they are, but um, they didn't know about that. So when I saw something saying, listen, this is torture and a UN rapporteur says that, um, I knew that finally I had weight to bring into my case. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing important to note, I just wonder, um, do you know if there's any other refugee cases of psychiatric abuse in Canada or were you the first and only one? No, you know, that was the thing. Um, so I went to meet with this uh, human rights lawyer. He's also the director of a refugee center um, and uh, Oh gosh, his name slips me right now. But anyway, I went to him and, you know, trying to show him the issues of my case. And he said, literally, Roxanne, you're going to lose because two Jamaicans came up saying exactly what you're saying. And they sent them back. They'll just say you're crazy and send you back. So please, please don't use this as your argument. You know, look at your husband's abuse and call it a day at that. Yeah. Well, so they, I know. they even went so far, like some of the lawyers would say, uh, no, you're crazy. They're just going to say you're crazy because you have your mental illness diagnosis. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So I was facing, I was definitely facing that. And I knew like one of the biggest problems would be like, uh, because when you're giving your testimony, most people are given um, the benefit of credibility. Like this person is a normal person, but if you have a mental health diagnosis against you, that's that's going to be a, an upward battle. Yeah, an uphill battle. 
Yeah. So you ultimately did win. I was so nervous for you because I was like, I don't know if she's going to win or lose because, you know, they charged you with kidnapping because you took your son with you. And what was the other chart? I don't know. The, you know, something that you'd forged or whatever to get out of the country. I I was like, oh no, she's going to lose. She's going to lose, but you did win. So can you talk about what did that feel like? That was, um, that was incredible. Um, first there was just a wave of relief and vindication, um, knowing that I won when every, almost every single professional that I met said that it would lose. And that was just such a great feeling. But what was even more amazing was reading through the judges reasons and decisions. So they give you a document saying, yes, your claim has been approved, but also she wrote a very long document as to why she was granted me refugee protection. And her referencing documents that I had submitted, referencing recordings that I had submitted, things that, you know, just just a lot of the work that I had done by myself, yeah. um, she referenced those documents and that 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 gave me such vindication, like so much like, I was doing the right thing. Everybody tried to keep on saying that, Roxanne, you don't know anything about refugee law. Roxanne, you don't know how the system works here in Canada. But here was this judge looking at everything that I had submitted, really going through my material and saying, yes, because it says here in this document. And I was like, this is amazing. Yeah. Even for me, just listening to her read that, read the facts line by line, like, yes, Roxanne was over-medicated. Yes. You know? That it, it not only does it give a validation to you that what you what happened and what you experienced is real, but even the audience of people you know that like us that have had things happen in the system that are not you know good, mm-hmm. you're like wow, like the judge, an outside person, an outside observer, actually saw and said like this is abuse. Yes. Yeah. 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 She absolutely did. So, big question: What was it like to create a film about this? Was it traumatic? Was it re-traumatizing like I mean you had to go through your whole story again and piece it all together yeah yeah well one of the things um for me it was so important to make a documentary about this make a, a visual story about this because I was like okay my case was so unique and also nobody had ever heard of this thing where you know if you're outside of psychiatry you know even for me um in Jamaica I did not know that people were being drugged against their will, that people were being locked up and their rights were being taken. You know, I thought, I, I, I had no clue that this was going on. So I knew that if I told persons what had happened to me, you're not gonna believe me if, you, if I told you. I, I'm gonna have to show you. I'm gonna have to show you. I'm gonna have to show you the recordings, show you what I went through, show you the UN documentation. I'm gonna have to show people because this story, for someone who doesn't know anything about the kind of abuses or coercion that happens in psychiatry, this is going to seem far-fetched. Yeah. What, a doctor is doing this? A doctor was threatening you and, and saying you had to have an abortion and, uh, you know, and all that. People are just not going to, you, you know, yeah, they wouldn't believe me if I told you so. I have to show you. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of that, I didn't think of this until now, but what happened to that doctor? Uh, which one? The doctor that was threatening me? Yes. Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. She's still in Jamaica doing her normal. And, and uh, you know, I spoke to a friend and, and apparently that I'm not the only person who she's overdrugged and mistreated and, and, and whatever. So, um, yeah. So I'm the thing is that, you know, and I know this as a Jamaican living in Jamaica, that persons who are in power and part of a social elite because you have a developing country like Jamaica where a lot of people are poor you know poverty it's a huge problem we have um, high illiteracy levels a lot of people don't have much more than a high school diploma and then you have doctors and lawyers and bankers and and politicians right they are at the top of society and um, you know basically they get away with a lot of things because you can't touch them or or they're friends with this politician, so don't try, you know, this, this guy is a big lawyer, and his family owns this, this, that, so you have this social elite that's very untouchable in Jamaica, so I, I'm absolutely, I would absolutely not be surprised, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure myself um, what exactly this doctor is doing, 
I haven't been back to Jamaica, nor can I go back. But, um, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if this person is just doing what they've always done with absolutely no consequences, l- legal repercussions for their actions. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, here, yeah, here's a good question from the audience. Uh, this person says, some people would say, well, there's only one bad apple. And they would say that about the Jamaican psychiatrist. Um, so what is your response to that? In other words, psychiatry is good. There's just bad apples that are bad. You know what? Um, from what I've learned in Jamaica, uh, there is definitely not just one bad apple, but when you have a culture of lack of accountability, lack of transparency, these people answer to nobody. Um, it's, it, it becomes, when you have this kind of closed door policy, I mean, for instance, even uh, Dr. Frank Knight, he said that I had no medical records, yet I had pictures of my medical records that I had taken, right? Um, so you have this kind of uh, cover and it's almost impenetrable because like uh, when you're just a normal person and you have these doctors who know lawyers and they know politicians and whatever, um, it creates an environment in which these kind of abuses and corruption can just take place and, um, you know, and it trickles down, you know, there's, there's a culture of corruption in Jamaica among people with power, with social power. So it's definitely, I wouldn't say, I, I've met good psychiatrists. I've certainly met good psychiatrists in Jamaica, but, um, you know, certain things, certain practices that they do that maybe they even know these, these don't stand up to, to international standards, but they're still, they're still practicing that way because there's no transparency and there's no accountability. So, yeah. And I mean, just for people in the United States, like her story might sound like that's so radical. Like it's, that doesn't happen here, but I can tell you just even in my own case, just like watching her story and listening to her today, like, um, I I fought for 14 months trying to explain withdrawal to my psychiatrist. And he just kept saying like, he literally wrote in my um, records, patient believes she's in benzodiazepine withdrawal and that brings her comfort. Like that I'm just delusional. You know what I mean? Like this doesn't happen. This doesn't exist. You know? And then I was told like, well, you have MS it's not withdrawal, you know? So this happens, maybe, maybe her, her case to the average person in the United States seems completely radical, but this happens in many ways, sometimes subtle, sometimes in your face and you're locked up against your will because you said you're suicidal or, you know, AOT, we haven't talked about that in our series, but assisted outpatient treatment is basically forced drugging that's legal and people take it on an outpatient basis. And I know many people that write us that talk about, I want to get off of this and they can't. So they don't have a choice and they do lose their rights. And it might be for bad behavior, or it might be for corruption of a bad doctor who just ran out of options and said, now you're going to be drugged because I don't know what to do with you. There's, I don't know. There's many reasons, but I just want to bring that into the conversation that don't think it's like, it doesn't happen here or, you know, it does. It it might be in more subtle ways. It might be as, as, as Roxanne's was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So, um, so what are the next steps for the movie? Where can people watch it first in case they missed it when I posted the other day? So um, you can watch it on YouTube, uh, do a search for a psychiatric refugee, or you can watch it at a psychiatric refugee.com. So that's the website there that you can watch it at. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. So yeah. now you're in Canada and your second son was born. What's his name again? I forgot. Bill. Oh, Bill. they're so cute. Benji's so cute. Uh-huh. Um, so what, uh, so what is your relationship now to the mental health care system? How is your treatment different in Canada? What is, what's your kind of recovery and stuff happening up there? Yeah, well, I was very lucky to find a psychiatrist that not only worked in mental health, but dealt, was specifically trained with the mental health of refugees. Um, so he understands the role of trauma uh, when it comes to mental health. And he was a great advocate for me. Um, you know, he was submitting letters um, like um, medical assessments regularly um, for my uh, for my refugee hearing. Um, he would submit all these medical assessments saying, you know, Rockhan's doing very well. Um, she's only on, you know, this minimal medication. She's very resilient. And he would be a great advocate. So um, I'm definitely lucky to have found him. I know that 
in North America, you know, you, you don't necessarily, you know, meet these, these gems, but I'm, I'm very lucky to, to have a gem of a doctor. And, um, you know, I, I, I have a relationship with the mental health, um, mental health in Canada. And I would say that, but it's definitely one that's uh, very, you know, ex exercise caution, you know, because it is still a system. It is still a system that can take away a person's rights. So you really have to make sure that, you know, in every facet you, you appear neurotypical to, you know, anything that can be seen as, you know, is that strange sure. behavior? You need to like make sure that you have nothing to do with it. Otherwise, you know, you could find yourself um, in a in a situation where um, your your rights could be taken away again. I'm glad that in Ontario, anyway, um, the mental health laws really put a lot of safeguards um, for patients uh, to um, get advocates for themselves, get rights advisors. There's a consent and capacity board that you can appeal to to challenge um, the decision of doctors. So there's there's that, um, and I've seen it work. I've seen at least people get their day in court to challenge. Mm -hmm. There's no legal recourse like that in Jamaica, certainly not, and uh, certainly nothing expedient anyway to, to help a person who's being locked up. So, yeah. So that leads to my last question. What advice can you give others who maybe experienced forced drugging or other oppressive treatments? Um, the First I'd advice, um, I would say the most important one is to always stay calm, <laughs> which is very hard to do when you really feel like you're being violated um, and those emotions. But the most important thing is uh, to stay calm and to consistently advocate for yourself, consistently challenge um, what's being done. Um, consistently, you know, I do believe that people do eventually get tired, you know, just, just keep chipping away. You know, if you're, you're getting a no, please keep, keep approaching lawyers, keep um, challenging the system. Um, because eventually I feel like, well, you know, not everybody is lucky enough to get that day in court, but you know, like um, keep challenging the system, keep consistently knocking against it using every legal recourse that you can, rights advisors, lawyers, you know, an advanced directive, whatever, to, to keep saying that, listen, you know, I'm not an insane, crazy, dangerous person. You know, I have the right to have autonomy and to have agency. Mm -hmm. I yeah. love that. And I, I just want to bring in Mind Freedom International. They have a lot of really good programs for people that are in this situation. Uh, I think it's called Shield. So if you're interested, or you're in that situation and you feel like you need help figuring out how to advocate for yourself, go check out Mind Freedom International, definitely. And I skipped a question by accident that I really wanted to know. Have you experienced any pushback for the film or for your story or from your family? Yeah, um, so <laughs> I'm expecting pushback. I haven't gotten it yet, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, so far, the reception of of the documentary has been really great. A lot of Jamaicans have been watching my documentary and I was surprised also, um, you know, because the attitudes towards mental health in Jamaica and the Caribbean community in general is not necessarily the best, um, you know, when, especially when they think of who doctors are and who a mentally, per, mentally ill person is in their mind. Um, I was thinking that most people would say, you know, the doctors would know what's good for you and stuff. But instead, um, I've been amazed. A lot of people have been saying, this is shocking. I can't believe this person did this. You know, I, I, I cannot believe this is happening here in Jamaica. And people have been reaching out to me via social media because I've been sharing it through Facebook and even sharing their, their personal um experience with psychiatry in Jamaica or a relative they have. So mm -hmm. it's, it's been an amazing reception, like overwhelmingly positive and just, you know, exactly what I was hoping for that their eyes would be open, that this is an issue. And literally people are like, I am shocked that this is going on. So it's really cool. 
Yeah. So here's a question from the audience. It's a hard question. What about those people who are crazy, unmanageable? Should they have the right to choice as well? You know what? Um, that's a very hard, that's it, is. Very, it, 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 is, it is a hard question because so many people have their rights taken away and, and, and there are no way a danger to society or anything like that. I would say that persons who are exhibiting behaviors that are, are, are dangerous or po problematic, well, I, I have a, a, a huge belief that the issues that they are facing are more social than they are mm. a medical issue. I mean, everything has been medicalized, you know, troubled behavior, aggressive behavior, antisocial behavior, it's all medicalized and, and people think, oh, you know, pop a pill and that can fix the problem when the issue may be like, what's going on at home? Is this person being abused? How did they grow up? What was their childhood like? You know, these are the issues that really need to be looked at um, holistically for for tr the treatment of a person who is exhibiting behaviors that are dangerous or are risk to themselves or others. You look at it from a social perspective and you'll probably see this person has had so much trauma uh, which is not being addressed and, and, and it probably will never be addressed if it's, if it's solely looked at in a medical context. They're like, oh, they're still acting out so let's use this pill, let's use that pill what are the the what are the resources that they need you know the holistic resources that they need and I think that's how people should be be looked at and treated that was an excellent that's an excellent answer because when I when you're when you're talking I was thinking you know you don't go in a psychiatrist's office screaming like it took you months to get there you know what yeah. I mean so it's always um the other the other thing is that we we perceive dangerousness because of our own fear, you know what I mean? So just because I'm raising my voice doesn't mean I'm gonna kill you. It just right, means right. I'm in a crisis and I'm scared and maybe I'm sc as scared as you are right now and I need help. It right. doesn't mean I need to be you know, restrained against a table that causes more trauma for the person. And then lastly, I just think about prevention. Like we need to prevent these things, these people from getting to this point of like, I have no other choice but to you know, hurt someone or hurt myself like that. There's a whole process that leads up to that, you know, that we had, we have intervention points. Yeah. yeah. That's a, yeah. that's a great answer though. All right. So we're coming toward the end of the talk. I don't think we have any more questions from the audience, but can you just tell, um, tell people about where to find you, where to find the film, um, any other resources that you want to share? Sure. So, um, so so the film is at a psychiatricrefugee.com. You can also do a, a YouTube search, a psychiatric refugee. And um, my personal website is roxannejohnsonmedia.com. So that's where I also have a link to the film there, but it's also my professional work as a mini aspiring filmmaker uh, and aspiring journalist. So that's, uh, that's where you can uh, see my stuff and learn more about me. And stuff. But also, um, there's a Facebook page for a psychiatric refugee. It's uh, it's Facebook.com/slash a psychiatric refugee, and uh, you can uh, join. Uh, look at the social media there. Perfect. And we're gonna put all the links below so you can follow the links. You don't have to remember what she just said. All right. Well, do you have any closing thoughts, Roxanne, to leave with our audience? Um, closing thoughts. Let's see. Um. Yeah, I, I know, like, um, just, you know what I, I found, um, I found that was just an overwhelming theme. So many people were very cynical um, when it came to trying to find help, like, oh, this will never work, and oh, it's sure to lose, and don't let people crush your dreams, you know what I mean? Like, I was like, don't pay attention to that cynical person who doesn't want to listen, you know, if you, if you have a dream, of escaping, you know, this, this thing where, you know, your rights are being taken away. A lot of people will say, um, like I was interviewing this doctor for a, a piece that I was working on, an investigative piece on antipsychotics. And he was like, it will never change. It will never change. You know, that that's how it is. This is a person who's an advocate for mental health rights, but he's so like, he's been so disappointed by what's going on. You know, it'll never change. But I'm like, no, you know, I see I see change on the horizon, especially with this whole Britney Spears issue, which is bringing 
psychiatric abuse and uh, you know medicalization on the forefront. It's 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 bringing it to um, you know to mainstream media, and it's like maybe we'll see a time where just as how there was a time where you know Jim Crow laws were barbaric. Now we look at that and we're like, how could these exist? You know, people will look and say, you know, oh my gosh, you know force treating someone that's barbaric, you know, we'll, we'll come to a time where this won't happen anymore. And, and I'm looking for, I think social change is on the horizon and don't be cynical, you know, believe in it, keep trying for it. And the social change will come where, where we we'll see psychiatry having to be seriously um, reformed. Yeah. And I think part of that is sharing your story the way that you did you know, that we all can contribute to that change if we share our stories. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, the audience is all saying thank you so much, Roxanne. So I just want you. you to know that they are all very appreciative for you, your, your time today and you sharing your story and just being so courageous about it. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Yeah. So for cl in closing, thank you all for joining this live discussion. If you haven't seen Medicaid Normal yet, please check out our website at medicaidnormal.com slash watch. Also go watch her film on YouTube, Psychiatric Refugee. You can find it in the search bar. We, um, we have more screenings coming up very soon. We also release new videos on our YouTube channel. This one will be, is being recorded and will be put over there in a couple weeks. So you can catch all the interviews that you missed, binge watch. I know that you want to do that. <laughs> so head over to YouTube and catch our channel too. Uh, we have more interviews coming up. We have Christina Kaiser. We have, hold on, let me think, Cindy Fisher from Rethinking Psychiatry. We have, oh, let me think, Jessica Taylor from the UK. And we have Stuart Shipko, coming up very soon. So just catch us every week. We don't have a set time. We do them whenever we can get the guests to come on. Lastly, um, if you'd like to support our outreach efforts, check out our website. We have alternatives and research posted there. And finally, thank you, Roxanne, for joining me today. Um, thank you for having me. All right. You all have a good week. See you next week. Thank you so much.